Uh, I'm uh, Martin Sanchez Jankowski, and the director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. For those who are our guests today, many of the other people know me. Um, I have a couple of announcements uh, before our speaker begins, and they are on upcoming events that are sponsored by uh, some of our centers, one in particular. Tomorrow, that's Wednesday the 17th, the Meyer Center for the Research on Native American Issues will host a film showing, or a, sh a film screening, uh, entitled Dancing Salmon Home, uh, which will be followed by a discussion by Michael Preston, who is a recent graduate of UC Berkeley and who is featured in the film. The film itself traces uh, members of the uh, Winnemem Wintu tribe here in Northern California as they travel to New Zealand to meet their long lost Chinook uh, salmon relatives as they have referred to it and asking the question where have they gone for the last 65 years. So with the idea that uh, planning to bring them, bring them home. This will take place the screening in, on the 10th floor of the Power Bar Building, downtown Berkeley, in room 1019. Uh, and the address is 2150 Shattuck Avenue, and the time is 4 to 5.30. That's tomorrow in the Power, in, in the power uh, Bar Building. Now, uh, I would, before we uh, begin, uh, like to remind all of you to turn off your cell phones. Uh, and of course, uh, please remember to sign, those of you who have been asked to do so, to sign the sign-in sheet, which is at the front of the door. The procedure for today's talk is what will occur for all of our talks. Our speaker will speak for about 45 minutes, and, and when that concludes, then we will have a question and answer period and I will be involved in basically establishing a queue for those of you who want to ask our speaker questions. Now, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, Professor uh, Mora. Uh, Professor Mora was a graduate of UC Berkeley and showing my, uh, my career and age, was a student in one of my classes uh, as an undergraduate and now has been nice enough to rejoin us in the sociology department. But between that time and now, she received her PhD from Princeton University in sociology. And also obtained and, and, and was a participant in the provost postdoctoral scholar program in sociology at the University of Chicago. Professor Moore's research focuses mainly on questions of racial and ethnic categorization, organizations, and immigration. Um, and she has a new project along those lines, uh, which she is examining the ways in which national Latino political organizations in the United States and Spain develop and implement pan-ethnic ethnic agendas. But we will have to wait for a little while before she presents that to us. Her work has uh, been published in venues such as the American Sociological Review, the Annual Review of Sociology, Ethnic and Racial Studies, Latino Studies, <coughs> and Poetics. Today, her talk is entitled, Making Hispanics, How Activists, Bureaucrats, and Media Constructed a New American. And this talk is based on her recently published book of the same title, published by the University of Chicago Press. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Mora. All right, thanks for coming out. I know it's uh, hot in here. <laughs> Probably hotter for me than it is for you. Um, OK, and I'll be speaking about my book, which came out in the spring with the Chicago Press. And so. To begin, I'd like you to consider what America looked like in the late 1960s. Specifically, if we could peek into the field of social movements, one would find images like this. Activists in the Southwest shouted Chicano power and led protests to draw attention to poverty and education issues. In the Northeast, 
Puerto Ricans were focused on denouncing Castro, and the in the Northeast, Puerto Ricans were used protests to highlight issues of Puerto Rican sovereignty and community development. And in Miami, political groups were focused on denouncing Castro and the developments of the Cuban Revolution. So what developed was, for the most part, a pattern of disparate political communities. Mexicans, organized Mexicans in the Southwest, Puerto Ricans organized co-ethnics in the Northeast, and Cubans did the same in Miami. Now, it's not that the idea of panethnicity didn't exist. In fact, the notion has a long history dating back to the efforts of Latin American independence leaders, and in the US it was often the mainstream media that spoke of a homogenous Spanish population. Rather, was that the idea of panethnicity hadn't been widely institutionalized. Indeed, early attempts at political unity were met with resistance as Mexicans and Puerto Ricans accused one another of trying to impose their agendas and with both groups resolving officially that they had little in common with Cubans. And we might think that in other sectors, perhaps like the market, we'd find much more pan-ethnic connectivity. But if we look at commercial television, we find this same patterns. TV guide listings show that Spanish language stations in the Southwest broadcasted several hours of Mexican programming. Puerto Rican entrepreneurs in New York imported soap operas, comedies, and other shows made in San Juan. And since Cuban programming couldn't be purchased, entrepreneurs in Miami rented studios and made their own shows for Cuban American audiences. Moreover, there was much resistance to pan-ethnic media strategies when station owners tried to, for example, provide Mexican programming to Cuban audiences and vice versa, they encountered loud disapproval. But America by 1990 looks much different. First, several of the major Mexican-American organizations evolve into these Hispanic ones, attracting Puerto Rican and Cuban constituents and lobbying on behalf of Hispanic civil rights. This is a picture of the National Hispanic Political Summit put on in 1988. By 1990, there's also a prosperous Spanish language television network, it's called Univision, that delivers the same programming to Mexican, Cuban, and Puerto Rican audiences. Last, but equally important, by 1990, there's this new category, it's called Hispanic. It's a new census category, which consolidates these communities into one statistical group. So I ask, how did this shift occur? Well, Journalists have argued that the change happened as sort of a shift in self-identification. They contend that as Latin American migration increased, people began living together and somehow they created a pan-ethnic outlook. But the available data that we have on pan-ethnic identification suggests that Hispanic panethnicity as an identity has increased, but it has only been after the establishment of Hispanic social movements, television network, and after the census category. This suggests that panethnicity was advanced, at least initially, through the efforts of organizations. And while up until last spring there was no text, really, that drew on archives and told the story of the national rise of panethnicity, nonetheless, academics had posited some explanations for the case. The majority drew on ideas about the symbolic power of the state to argue that census officials simply imposed the category onto communities in order to gather more accurate information on Latin American migration. Others pointed to a sort of ethnic mobilization theory to argue that it was political leaders who popularized panethnicity in order to join the resources of their communities. Last, others pointed to the market. They note that commercial television creates mass images that homogenize the distinctiveness of Latin American groups. In effect, the accounts provide really an additive model of panethnicity, which assumes that the organizational shift occurred as a sum of disparate parts. As a result, we knew little about the relational mechanisms that might have accounted for this shift, even though, at least in sociology, are prominent theories about classifications, and ethnic conflict suggests that categories emerge relationally. What my work generally <laughs> argues is that Hispanic panethnicity emerged from a sort of series of what I call cross-field effects, wherein developments in one sector influence those in another. At the broadest basic level, the effects look like this. First, 
Mexican American and Puerto Rican activists made claims on the Census Bureau demanding better data. In doing so, they shifted the way that the Bureau perceived these communities. In response, the Census Bureau negotiated a Hispanic data category, and this data served as an important resource for social movements and media firms alike, motivating them to understand ethnic groups as part of a larger meta conglomerate. Third, activists, census officials, and media executives work together to popularize and endorse the idea of a Hispanic identity. And so the Hispanic case more generally highlights the important role of cooperation here. Although most accounts of ethnic and racial categorization stress conflict, the classification struggles, if you will, the Hispanic case shows that collaboration and joint interests can also allow for the creation of new categories. And what I want to argue today is that organizations in each sector, these interest groups, if you will, developed important discursive strategies which made it possible for them to collaborate. Organizations developed their own representations of panethnicity, which suited their efforts as they responded to changes in their field. And as they developed links to one another, they began to share these representations. The more they collaborated, the more they drew on each other's frames and narratives, and the more ambiguous the idea of panethnicity became. So I argue that these discursive strategies, these sort of narrative sharing and ambiguity, were necessary part of the emergence of Hispanic panethnicity. They essentially formed the basis for which collaboration became possible. Now I arrived at this account by drawing on several data sources, um, and here are some of them listed. Now, to show how Hispanic panethnicity became institutionalized in 40 minutes, what I'll do today is focus mainly on three organizations. Uh, specifically, I'll focus on and show you how they changed over time and how they adopted the idea of panethnicity. And I'll focus on the National Council La Raza, which is the nation's earliest Hispanic organization, the U.S. Census Bureau, and Univision. And missing from this account today is, how org is uh, the role of the Executive Office and of Congress, but we can certainly discuss that in the Q&A. But what I'll stress today is how these organizations developed a specific representation of panethnicity. Then what I'll do is show you how these organizations cooperated and developed discursive strategies that effectively created an ambiguous definition of Hispanic. So I'll, be I'll begin with the National Council of La Raza, which I'll call NCLR for short. And I'll show that it evolved from a Chicano to a Hispanic organization because the notion of panethnicity could make the organization seem national and more attractive to grant-making agencies. And I show that NCLR drew on analogies with blacks to represent Hispanics as a disadvantaged minority group whose overall numbers and needs rivaled that of African Americans. So NCLR was established in 1968 by Chicano activists, and in fact, the organization's original name was actually the Southwest Council La Raza which reflected its regional and co-ethnic focus. In the beginning, NCLR staged protests to shed light on issues like education reform, and they created community projects, like vocational training programs. In fact, the organization expected that protests would help raise an awareness and attract resources for their community projects. Although it had some early success, it simply could not generate enough funds to manage its projects. So it began to apply for grants. But this funding was still scarce, and NCLR activists believed that this was because government agencies and foundations perceived of blacks as more deserving of resources. In an early board meeting, the president of NCLR exclaimed loudly, every time we walk out in Albuquerque, we're clouded by something happening in Selma or Montgomery. Chicanos are invisible in the eyes of public officials in this country. Every time we have a legitimate set of complaints to present, Watts is burning or Rochester is burning and the federal money goes to blacks. And this sentiment was shared by others. Thus, in 1971, the Civil Rights Commission reported that African American movements had, quote, significantly overshadowed Mexican Americans' demands for equal protection. And the Council on Foundations annual report had shown that while well, between 1960 and 1970, Foundations have provided over 400 grants to African-American groups that only 11 had gone to Mexican-American ones. 
NCLR also saw groups like the NAACP receive multi-million dollar grants for their projects, and they felt slighted. Under these conditions, the leadership held a decisive meeting to discuss their future direction. Some wanted to engage in more protests and consciousness raising. Others wanted NCLR to be more focused on grant projects, to, quote, be more like the blacks, one leader said. In a decisive vote, the protest-oriented leadership was struck down, prompting them to exit and then later accuse NCLR of becoming more bureaucratic and conservative. Nonetheless, following the lead of groups like the NAACP, NCLR then made three major changes. First, it moved its headquarters to DC, where it created networks with government insiders and private foundations. Second, it changed its name from the Southwest Council to the National Council of La Raza. And the main reason for this was that in talks with the Ford Foundation, NCLR found that grant-making agencies would rather provide monies to national causes to programs that would affect change in various cities. By reframing itself as national, NCLR hoped to seem more attractive. Third, NCLR established what they called a research and policy analysis unit, similar to the one the NAACP had. Essentially, the unit would use data to pen reports that raised awareness in Washington about Mexican-American issues. There was one major problem. Specifically, there was a lack of official government data on Mexican Americans because agencies like the Census Bureau categorized Mexicans as mainly white, effectively disguising their condition. In a board meeting, one member explained, we know that Mexican Americans have high rates of unemployment, higher than Anglos and higher than blacks, but when the Bureau writes its reports, it's about blacks and whites, our information gets lost, mixed in with whites. Puerto Ricans also had this problem, so NCLR joined with Puerto Rican groups and they protested the Bureau, demanding that it stop labeling their data as simply white. As a result of this effort, NCLR members were invited to join census committees, which ultimately created a Hispanic category as early as 1975. And this category resolved several issues. The first was the region issue. The Hispanic category represented a sort of national constituency. Given that Mexican Americans were still highly clustered in the Southwest, becoming a Hispanic organization could make NCLR and its constituents seem like a national group. The second issue the category resolved was size. A Hispanic constituency was simply larger than a Mexican American one, and NCLR believed that by arguing that its constituency was sizable, perhaps even larger than blacks, that it could receive more attention and more funding. And NCLR began to make this argument as soon as the Bureau tested the Hispanic category. In an article for the organization's newsletter, the president wrote, the census shows that Hispanics are the nation's largest minority, larger than blacks if you include Puerto Rico. And at that time, you had to include the entire island of Puerto Rico to make that uh, argument. <laughs> but we're the most neglected. We have less representation, less funding, and less protection in this country. And in addition, with the new Hispanic census data and its new national identity, NCLR began to create policy reports and grant applications about Hispanics in America. And as NCLR wins these grants, it uses the money to fund Hispanic programs in New York and Miami, attracting Puerto Rican and Cuban affiliates. It also creates a National Hispanic Leadership Conference in 1976 by inviting Cubans and Puerto Ricans that it had ties to in Washington and in that conference, speakers stressed that Hispanic unity could be an effective mobilizing strategy. So this is an excerpt from the keynote speech at that conference. It says, the 1960s was a decade for our black brothers. Surely the 1980s will be the decade for Hispanics. We have suffered disdain, neglect, and disadvantage, which has taught us many lessons, but our time in the sun is upon us. Together, we are motivated to combat the institutional forces that exclude us, because in unity, there is strength. So there's this idea that panethnicity can be an effective mobilizing strategy. And by 1977, NCLR begins to attract more constituents on the East Coast, and it changes its mission statement, substituting words, going in there, substituting words like Chicano, Mexican, and Aslan with terms like Hispanic and sometimes Latino. 
and it also revises its executive board guidelines and now reserves a mi minimum number of positions for Puerto Ricans and Cubans. And by 1980, NCLR had become the nation's foremost Hispanic lobby group. And in effect, what the case of NCLR shows is that panethnicity emerges in the broader civic sectors, not simply because what you're doing is pooling resources, but because in a context where ethnic communities are competing for these resources, panethnicity can reframe the meaning of these groups and create analogous links with other minority populations. So let me now transition and focus on the Census Bureau. And what, what, what I want to show here is that the panethnic category was adopted because it de could deflect criticism from minority organizations and secure their cooperation. And I'll show that the Bureau ultimately represented panethnicity as sort of a meta-statistical category, which complemented instead of replace ethnic identity. The account of the Bureau begins right after the 1970 census when it received an unprecedented number of complaints from groups who argue that the agency had undercounted minorities. These are just a few of the headlines. Perhaps most damaging for the Bureau was a report by the Civil Rights Commission that called the census count of, quote, Spanish speakers as disastrous. Feeling the pressure, Nixon replaced the census director, who then created a minority advisory council to plan for the 1980 count. Specifically because the Civil Rights Commission had criticized the count of Spanish speakers, the Bureau created a Spanish origin advisory council that included members of NCLR, as well as Puerto Rican activists, and some Cuban leaders that had ties to Nixon. Beginning in 72, the council held regular meetings on the issue of the undercount. But council members were also conscious of the classification issue, and they demanded that the Bureau stop grouping their data with white. Specifically, they wanted the Bureau to insert their ethnic groups as a sort of racial classification, similar to the way some nationalities, such as Chinese, were included on the census. So the question would have looked like this, with nationality as a racial classification. But for the Bureau, this was an absolute non-starter. In a memo, the director complained that this method would have made it possible for, quote, every other damn country south of the border to have its own label. Instead, the Bureau proposed a Spanish origin category that would cluster the subgroups together. It proposed the following. The question would have a meta category, but opportunities for subgroup identification. For activists, the category seemed plausible. On the one hand, it could provide them with the data for their individual group. On the other hand, it provided this other category that would count two important populations. The first was the newly emerging groups of mixed Latino or mixed Cuban and Puerto Rican uh, that lived mainly on the East Coast. The second group consisted of individuals who had been in the Southwest for generations but didn't define themselves as Mexicans. They called themselves Hispano in New York, in New Mexico, and in Texas they called themselves Tejanos, and here in California they called themselves well, Californios. Activists argued that there needed to be some other non-national, but also non-white category that could cover these groups. And for the Bureau, this other category could eventually encompass other Spanish-speaking populations like Central and South Americans, especially the Central American population that was by then growing in the DC area. There was still the issue of whether the new category would be a race or whether it would be an ethnicity. The council members voted to make it, to make it a race, arguing that the people of Latin America were a mixture of European, indigenous, and African ancestry, and thus were not just white. However, the Bureau decided against this racial designation. They did so in part because when they included a Hispanic category in the race question during pre-census trials and thus forced individuals to choose if they were, for instance, Hispanic or black, the number of blacks dropped. So in an interview with a former census official, he recalled a critical meeting where the Bureau discussed the issue of race. He states, the census director spoke of the danger of including the Hispanic category as a racial one. He knew he'd get complaints from blacks if their numbers went down overall. And you had to think about the Puerto Ricans. This was a real possibility. Not to mention Native American numbers in the Southwest. There was even the fear that Filipinos in California would choose Hispanic over Asian, and we'd get it from all three groups. <laughs> 
And this fear of other groups, especially African Americans, was real. Indeed, in 77, the Bureau even led a discussion forum with members of the NAACP to assure them that the new Hispanic category would not be a racial one, and more importantly, that the number of Hispanics would not surpass the number of blacks in 1980. And in fact, they, at that time, they actually estimated that Hispanics wouldn't outnumber African Americans until the year 2057. Council members were fairly quiet on the issue, noting to, in census meetings that they would not wish to cause division with their, quote, black brothers and sisters. And all seemed set for the 80 census count until Jimmy Carter replaced the census director who eliminated the Hispanic question and instead included this new ethnicity question. The new director reasoned that this would be a more fair option because no other ethnic group had their own question. Furthermore, he reasoned that the new question would still provide Hispanics with information on their overall numbers. Needless to say, this enraged activists, who argued that it simply homogenized them. They noted that while they shared commonalities, there were effectively different groups with different needs. Moreover, they threatened to call for a boycott of the census if this new question were used. Nonetheless, the Bureau went ahead and tested this question pre-census trial in late 78. They actually tested this question in Oakland here. But the results were disastrous. While the number of African Americans seemed accurate, the number of Hispanics, the people that just chose the Hispanic question, the Hispanic category, was staggeringly low and unreliable. Largely, the census found out, because people were really unfamiliar with this label. The Bureau quickly shelved this plan, and soon after, Carter reinstated the previous director. <laughs> and so the final question looked like this. It's a Hispanic category with subcategories where data can be separated, thus appeasing individual groups, or it's aggregated together, signaling a statistical metagroup. And in the end, it's designated as a separate ethnicity question so that an individual might choose to be black and Hispanic, or white and Hispanic. And what the case suggests is that penethnic categories emerge when the state responds to demand, to demands in a way that creates meta-categories, because these sort of large categories are what the state is familiar with. It's what the state works with. But these categories can also provide opportunities for ethnic expression, such as panethnicity doesn't become mutually exclusive with ethnic identification. These subcategories became incredibly important. The final organization that I'll cover is Univision to show how the shift towards panethnicity occurred in the market. And I'll show that Univision adopted the idea of panethnicity in order to make its audience <coughs> seem like a national one, like a national consumer market, and to gain legitimacy with advertisers. And I'll show that Univision represented Hispanics as a sort of cultural group that held distinct taste and distinct consumer behaviors. Univision began as a network in 1965 with two stations operating in San Antonio and Los Angeles, and it basically imported 95% of its programming from Mexico. The network sought to expand and include stations in places like Phoenix and San Francisco, but it faced an important obstacle. Major corporations were not willing to purchase advertisements, and until that time, Univision had gotten by with money from local businesses, but this was not enough for expansion. Advertisers were unwilling to invest because on the one hand, they believed that Mexicans, like Italians and the Irish before him, would simply assimilate into the mainstream population. They didn't really see a boundary between Mexican immigrants and the descendants of European migration. Thus, in an early press interview, the president of Univision stated, advertisers used to say, well, you know, Mexican immigrants aren't going to watch television in Spanish. They have all these English channels that they've gotten used to. Why would they want to look at a Spanish station? And they're old, and these people will be dying, and the second generation just doesn't speak Spanish. Yet the other major trouble with expansion was that Univision was focused on the Southwest and major advertisers had already begun ac become accustomed to investing in national network television. For their part, corporations didn't believe it'd be profitable to make a commercial that'd only be shown in the Southwest, 
especially when they could purchase advertising on NBC or ABC and have one commercial broadcast to the entire country. To deal with these obstacles, Univision did two things. First, they acquired money from Mexican investors, but instead of abiding by their original goal, just sort of concentrating in the Southwest, they used the capital to establish a station in New York City in 1970. And in an interview that I conducted with the former vice president of Univision, he stated simply, look, if Madison Avenue couldn't turn on the television and see us, well then we just didn't exist to them. And Madison Avenue is a sort of iconic symbol of the major ad firms that were all clustered in New York during that era. And so if advertisers couldn't see Univision on their own sets, then, well, perhaps it wasn't a network that warranted their money or their attention. So Univision created a station in New York, in addition established networks or affiliates in cities like Chicago, DC, Boston, and Miami. And within 10 years, by 1980, Univision had UHF affiliates in most major markets. And with expansion, Univision could create ads like these that displayed its audience as a national one. And they did this in hopes of seeming more legitimate to advertisers. This is part of a 77 ad published in a marketing trade magazine. Now the second way that Univision tried to convince advertisers to invest in the company was by focusing on data. See, when advertisers thought that Mexicans would assimilate and quote, die out, they weren't really drawing on data in large part because the Census Bureau and other government agencies classified Latin Americans mainly as white, effectively disguising their numbers and their projected growth. Thus, Univision would constantly draw on smaller surveys, create, create their own numbers and their own estimates to prove that its audience was sizable. But this often created confusion because adver to advertisers, these numbers lack legitimacy. Indeed, in an early press interview, an advertiser commented on the confusion, noting, the Spanish population of the border states? I don't know. It could be anywhere between one and four million depending on who you ask and what survey they want to show you. So the Hispanic census category was a huge boon to this industry. For now, they could provide corporations with official government data that detailed the size of their potential audience and that created a boundary between Univision audiences and whites. But instead of simply using the census data to denote size and they coupled it with their own surveys of consumer traits to create manuals about the national Hispanic market. For example, this manual was the first on Hispanic marketing. It was published by Univision shortly after the release of census data. The manual had phrases like this. The Census Bureau shows that Hispanics are a growing population. They have larger families than other groups and their median age is younger. And since we know that they are family oriented, at the very least, the numbers mean that they'll purchase more diapers and more household products than other groups. So we see here that census figures are coupled with an argument about cultural values and about consumer behaviors. It's a description of Hispanics as family oriented, and this is translated into particular consumer practices, buying more diapers. And they use this Hispanics as consumer friends to boost their ad sales. Over time, the boom in marketing generates profits that allow Univision to create its own programming. They begin slowly with Hispanic nightly newscasts, which uses Mexican anchors, but Cuban and Puerto Rican news reporters. And it snips together pieces of news from across Latin America. And to pull off these sort of US Hispanic shows, Anchors had to be trained to de-accentize their Spanish to sort of communicate to Mexican, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans alike. And specifically, journalists had language manuals and were taught a, a sort of Costa Rican Spanish because this was thought to be the most pure and accentless. And by late 1980, the newscast was supplemented with talk shows and variety shows and game shows that were filmed in the US and catered to what Univision called the new American Hispanic population. And for example, the talk shows featured topics like raising the second generation in the US, and the variety shows included diverse musical acts from different regions and parts of the Hispanic community. The message of these shows was that Latin American migrants were diverse, but they had some sort of common taste and some sort of common experience. 
By 1995, 75% of programming was comprised of shows made by Univision in the U.S. And so ultimately, we see that in the market sector, pet ethnicity becomes a way to represent subgroups as sizable, culturally bounded consumer market. Okay, so let me quickly recap what I've explained so far. I've shown that initially, activists made claims on the Bureau demanding a boundary between their groups and whites and the Bureau negotiated the idea of panethnicity, which it saw as a meta-category that was complementary to ethnic identity. NCLR used the data to create grant reports and uh, lobbying proposals in which they developed an analogy between Hispanics and blacks and framed Hispanics as a sort of disadvantaged group. And Univision created cultural images of the Hispanic community and created an argument about consumer practices. And really, none of these organizations could have developed these arguments on their own. The idea of a Hispanic category became available to the Bureau as it negotiated with activists. And for NCLR and Univision, panethnicity could become a successful organizational strategy because it could draw on census data. What I'm going to focus on now is the way that all three of these organizations depended on each other and the way they worked together because it was only by coming together that they could attach the census category to a salient Hispanic identity. Indeed, the Bureau depended heavily on activists and media executives because they needed them to help individuals to identify with the Hispanic category. So the Bureau asked political groups, including NCLR, to, publish the, to publicize the Hispanic census question. In response, these groups held town hall meetings across the country that introduced individuals to the new Hispanic question and implored them to identify with the category. So this is one of the flyers that NCLR made and handed out in different town halls across the country from Miami, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. It says, we're united, we're Hispanic on the 1980 census. And in a sense, it was political leaders not state bureaucrats that could legitimize the category and attach it to in a sense of an identity. And in a series of meetings, the Bureau reached out to Univision, imploring them to publicize the category as well. And Univision certainly agreed to help. In a letter to the Bureau, the president of, the, of Univision wrote, in a major public service effort, Univision will air commercials and news specials urging Spanish speakers to be counted in 1980. The, program, the programs will explain government procedures and demonstrate how to fill out qu questionnaires, placing special emphasis on the Hispanic category. And in an interview that uh, I had with the former Univision president, he explained that lots of times many of these uh, special segments were actually commercials with the woman holding up the 1980 census form. And there was a big circle around the Hispanic question, right? Moreover, media and activist groups helped the Census Bureau to popularize the notion of panethnicity among other state agencies. See, throughout the 70s and the 80s, activists and media executives wrote to vital statistics offices across the country, arguing that Hispanics were a separate, non-white community in hopes of convincing them to insert a Hispanic category on birth certificates. Until that point, vital statistics offices in states like Michigan and Georgia refused to follow the Bureau's repeated recommendations, arguing that they only tallied racial and not ethnic categories. Even though the Bureau persisted, it wasn't until activists and media executives joined the efforts that some states <coughs> began to budge. This took effort, but by 1990, all 50 states had included <coughs> a Hispanic category on birth certificates. Yet there was also links between Univision and activist groups that amounted to a sort of sharing of narratives, where NCLR begins to speak somehow about Hispanics as consumers, and media executives begin to speak about Hispanics as an underrepresented, disadvantaged group. <laughs> the move begins as early as 1980, when funding from private organizations becomes scarce, and NCLR begins to ask corporate charities for contribution. To do so, to learn how to do so, NCLR meets with Univision marketers to gain networks to companies that are already advertising in Spanish language television. 
And NCLR sends out solicitation letters with statements like this. And this is from a prototype letter made in 1981 that encourages companies to contribute. The first paragraph read exactly like this. Everybody's talking about it. The Hispanic market. Enough talk. Stand up and participate. Contribute to NCLR. Contribution to us is an effective way of reaching the Hispanic leadership and building goodwill for your product or service. So the idea is that a contribution to a Hispanic cause can translate into positive publicity among Hispanic consumers. And Univision, for its part, had been using activists as an underrepresented minority rhetoric since the late 70s to gain access to special tax breaks that the FCC had instated for minority media owners. For example, in one hearing, the head of Univision stated, Spanish language audiences are one of the most underserved and isolated groups in America. Their communities lack resources, including serious news and information outlets. Univision serves a public interest but by providing for the needs of this disadvantaged minority population. And really, this argument would have not held much weight if it wasn't that activists hadn't already emphasized that there was indeed a boundary between Hispanics and whites, and that Hispanics were a disadvantaged lot. In other words, the narrative needed to originate in the social movement field before it could travel and be of use in the media. And the same for Hispanics as a consumer narrative. It needed to originate and be legitimated first by media before it could be of use to activists. But we must step back and think that managing these two narratives would be jarring. If we think of NCLR, just think about it. On the one hand, they argue to the state and to foundations that Hispanics are a poor, disadvantaged minority law. On the other hand, they argue to corporate foundations that Hispanics are an untapped, luc lucrative, and upcoming market. And really, one of the only ways that these two images can be reconciled is if organizations appeal to a higher, more broad, and ambiguous definition, one that can link these ideas together. And this is precisely what organizations do. As they collaborate, their representations of pan-ethnicity become more and more ambiguous. They speak about Hispanics as having a common culture, a commitment to family, and how they're all hardworking. But that's about it. So the Bureau begins to frame the idea of pan-ethnicity not simply as a statistical category, but as a cultural identity. For example, a Bureau report written in 85 begins Hispanics can trace their roots in the Americas back five centuries. They share common heritage, common values, and a common mother tongue. These and other ties unite them from east to west, north to south. Interestingly, this report was written by a former NCLR member who went on to work for the, for the Bureau. But it, what it shows is that the idea of Hispanic identity is very ambiguous. It's based not an argument about concrete statistical patterns, not on an argument about disadvantage or arguments about consumption, but rather the identity is framed as rooted as some sort of vague common heritage and a connection, some kind of connection to a mother tongue. And consider this statement published by NCLR in its magazine in defense of Univision. NCLR wrote, Hispanics prefer media choices characterized by the presentation of shared cultural experiences with programs that speak to their valuation of family and traditions and with ties to their countries of origin. And here what there is is an image of Hispanics as a sort of bounded by values, by an abstract set of cultural behaviors. And indeed it's telling that neither census officials or activists or media ever created an official definition or an official list of what exact groups were Hispanic. So the Hispanic case is really one where organizations work together, in large part because the goals of each interest group can only be met and maintained through collaboration. And so you can't just really have a sort of state-centered theory because the state needs very much to have ethnic leaders, both market and political ones, to legitimate and connect its labels to ideas about identity. And you can't just really have an ethnic mobilization thesis because what sustains mobilizing frames over time, if movements are to grow, to become more formal, is statistical data, which only becomes available through negotiation with the state. You can't really have just a market explanation for the same reason. 
because markets become ruled by this data imperative. Furthermore, it's difficult to say that we have all three of these things in an additive fashion because there are important relational mechanisms much at work. There was certainly negotiation, and in this case there was collaboration. Indeed, without negotiating with activists, the idea of a Hispanic census category would have remained virtually unthinkable to state bureaucrats. And activists themselves would have likely not thought of panethnicity as a viable form of organization. And as organizations work together, they developed a sort of plausibility structure where they developed common discursive strategies to advance the notion of panethnicity as an identity. Thus, they drew on each other's narratives, effectively popularizing them in other sectors. NCLR bought the frame of Hispanics as consumers to the civic sector, effectively making that language newly available to the new and emerging civic groups that came after. And Univision helped to make the language of Hispanics as a minority available to many other media entrepreneurs. But these otherwise contradictory representations could hang together because the idea of panethnicity becomes defined as vague, abstract, and then taken for granted. And so ideas about consumption or about social disadvantage become only characteristics of the Hispanic community, but not the sole definition of what makes Hispanics Hispanic. So to conclude, I'd just like to speak for a minute about the broader question of boundaries and ethnic categories. The empirical motivations for this project were clear. But there were also the broader issues of how boundaries are made and how new categories emerge out of smaller ones. And I think the, pro the project highlights the important role of resources and historically constitutive moments, the when and why of boundary expansion. But it also details the critical role that discursive strategies play in how boundaries are to be made. In this case, Indeed, this case shows that if new identity categories are to emerge and if they're going to have staying power and diffuse, an organization and interest groups are going to have to frame panethnic categories with a certain degree of ambiguity. Because you have two issues here. On the one hand, you have this goal of expansion. You need to create a larger group out of much smaller groups. And on the other hand, you still need a boundary to distinguish this new large group from others. And to manage these two things, actors need to create a narrative about difference. But this narrative can't be too restricting, for it will need to accommodate all the different interests. The idea of Hispanic, just like the idea of many other pan-national and pan-ethnic identities, has staying power for now, because it can mean different things to different interests. And it's not necessarily a contradiction to say that Hispanics are a minority or that they are a market. Because in the end, at the highest level, they are a group bounded by some sort of common values. And this means then, of course, that individuals can also imbue these categories with different meanings. And to keep this expanded, ambiguous category within reason, tools like analogy, which create almost categorical pairings, become essential aspects of boundary expansion. Analogies transpose meanings from one group to another. Hispanics are like African Americans so that you can see that a new group is defined by drawing on the characteristics of a pre-existing one. But analogies also affirm a difference. In the case, Hispanics are like blacks, but the two groups are not one and the same. In other words, these analogies help interest groups to delimit ambiguity and thus develop boundaries around the meta group. And so I think that a shared investment in ambiguity and other strategies to this day is really what is at the core of the Hispanic category. It's what makes the category expansive and powerful. Ultimately, though, the case shows that categories aren't simply imposed onto populations by state bureaucrats, but rather they're products of continuous struggles, negotiations, and brokered opportunities to meld state, market, and civic interests. Thanks very much. And now I actually will uh, start a queue for questions. Um, thanks for a fascinating talk. Uh, um, uh, my question is uh, about the link between um, the 1960s civil rights movement and the NAACP and then the movement you described 
seems to me that uh, uh, the civil rights movement was really uh, a profound precursor to this, to this kind of mobilization. I mean, the, the notion of a disadvantaged minority was already institutionalized for a different ethnic group. So it seems like, I mean, it's a very different task for people to take that existing framework and then just you know, put it on a new group of people. I understand it's not simple. But, um, so my question is, uh, do you see a connection between uh, the sort of um, enforced pan-ethnicity of African Americans when they couldn't bring their identities with them oh. at, at all? Uh, and that was sort of the basic framework for, for this movement. Uh, connection between that and the uh, emergent pan-ethnicity of, um, of Hispanics. Yeah. Um, the way I would see the, the civil rights movement was certainly this is the opportunity that sort of opened. This is when they could start thinking about mobilizing and getting government attention. I mean, you had sort of Chicano mobilizing before that, especially in the Southwest, doing protests, but it was mainly focused at sort of a regional, uh, like the school board level, or sometimes at the state level. Ninth, the sort of civil rights movement opened up this opportunity that we need to speak to the federal government and the federal government needs to speak to us. But what was happening though is at that same time is that the federal government is seeing blacks as sort of the minority or as the minority of contention. And so these Mexican Americans are sort of, we don't know what to do with them. In fact, when they first went out to DC, you know, their first strategy wasn't to go pan-ethnic. Their first strategy was to say, bring Mexican-American issues to, to D.C., like have them see us. And the way they would sometimes do it is they would try to do whatever they could get, school board data, whatever they could get, uh, local city census data, and prove that there were Mexican-Americans, which there were, you know, small amounts, working in fields in Florida and in upstate New York, and say, we're a national issue. We're a national issue, we deserve national attention. At that time though, the federal government was, we don't need another one on our hands. We don't need another fight here. You know, you're a regional issue, go speak to your regional. You know, this is, this is an issue for the governor of California, this is an issue for the governor of the state of Texas. And so it wasn't as if they were necessarily readily available to say, okay, we're gonna open the door, but we're only gonna open the door if you're Hispanic. This had to be a strategy that they then went back and said, they're still ignoring us, even though we're knocking at that big door. But I think where the role of the civil rights movement starts is it uh, provides that opportunity to knock at that big door and then sort of revise. And then they were constantly looking at what is making the NAACP in some way successful. And they were constantly looking at organizational strategies to them in that way but sort of going back and thinking about how they were going to frame themselves and the best way to do that really comes with how the way that they can prove who they are. You know, and if they can't do it with Mexican American data, they can do it with Hispanic data, right? Okay. Now I wanted to bring forward a parallel development in the sciences mm -hmm. as sort of counterintuitive to what sociologists and anthropologists talk about. And that's to do with your comments early on about ethnicity and race and the tensions between them. Yeah. On the one hand, uh, the, the lack of convergence. On the other hand, it's all at the moment <coughs> convergence. So here's, here's, the, here's the quick quick history. In the early 90s, the NIH and the National Science Foundation began to argue for parallel uh, discussions in the sciences about health disparities between blacks, uh, whites, Native Americans, and Latinos. So scientists began to publish research um, health disparities, cancer, asthma, diabetes in particular. In the last period, we we're seeing a re remarkable development in the sciences. So the category Hispanic has become, as and the colleague, the wonderful Molly puts it, mo the molecularization of ethnicity. So now we're talking about admixture research in the sciences where asthma, diabetes, and cancer are understood not in terms of anything other than the molecular developments around genetics. So if you look at the literature of the last 15 years, people like Esteban Bouchard over at UC San Francisco are talking about asthma, not in terms of ethnicity, but molecular differences between different groups. But Hispanic has now become, in many, in many reports, a category like race. And they're contrasting whites, blacks, Native Americans, and Hispanics at this level. But it's a remarkable development. 
which again, I think sociologists who take a closer look at because this whole issue of identity. One of your comments. <laughs> well, one of my comments is that I am looking at that issue. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, a long-term project has been to see, I became really interested at what was the discourse that was going on in the 80s and in the 90s. And if you track some of the first, so if you track some of the first trials on diabetes that look at Latinos, they just look at uh, like Mexican Americans and then they start looking at Puerto Ricans and then there's this really odd jump and I guess with sort of the national uh, legislation or the policy moves to and be inclusive, that makes them suddenly Latino. But even when you're looking at the Mexican American ones, they start talking about sort of these Amerindian genes, right? That might have something to do with their genetic uh, makeup or whatnot. And so there's this tension then. And then also the whole issue of, uh, was it recently, like five years ago? Um, where they had a, you know, uh, a, a genetics, uh, a student was just uh, telling me this, where they had a genetics uh, conference in which they decided that there wouldn't be discrimination or di disadvantage in genetics research, and so, which was mainly connected to our big racial categories, and so they, there was a big fight to have Mexican Americans as somehow seen as genetically distinct, somehow seen as sort of a genetic category. I think, um, I think this is the funny part of a lot of this, right? What fascinated me the most with this is why if the activists had said, you know, we're not white because even though you think that we're white and even though perhaps in Jim Crow, Texas in the 1930s we claimed we were white in order to sort of not be on the disadvantaged color line, our everyday experience doesn't speak to whiteness, our everyday experience doesn't give us this and so make us something else. In fact, they even said, give us a brown category. We're the brown race. And if like, you're a statistician or a demographer, you can see how all the trouble with having suddenly a brown category on the census, right? And so I think it, had a, it was a lot about politics and the way that politics are around sort of the way that they're placed in one or another. But it gave them a lot of trouble. So they do, weren't a race, then what happens? When they call up Georgia or Michigan and say, put us on your birth certificates, they're gonna say, no, we only look at race and not ethnicity. Or a census director is gonna come in and say, hey, why do you get to be the privileged ethnic group that has your own question, right? And so this is where these distinctions between race and ethnicity really matter. Or perhaps this might have been one of the reasons why early race research on heart disease, for example, for example, is all about, if it's going to look at race, about black-white differences, you know? Maybe when you don't establish it as a racial category, it sort of stays in this fuzzy arena where people can, and institutions can do with it what they like. Yes. Um, so actually to build up the that self-identification thing, I was talking with John Powell the other day, who was saying that there is actually a question of whether or not um, we would truly become a minority majority <coughs> nation because um, Latinos or Hispanics would start are starting to self identify as white yeah. on the census bureau. And I was and, and so it was just sort of like it's like going in reverse direction towards like more, more like working towards whiteness as a category now. I'm just wondering what sort of implications that may have in terms of yeah. <laughs> the, making, the making of what? <laughs> yeah, I follow some of the current census debates now. I, there's a lot of difficulty with that. One, one is um, the narrative of what you should be, right? So when you came out as ethnicity, everyone said, mark yourself as Hispanic. Only in certain places did they say what to do with race. In fact, if you look at some of the large discussions, the biggest discussion in Latino media is like, hey, why are there these two questions and what am I supposed to do with this race one? This is why you have a large percentage of Latinos consistently marking that they're other because they don't understand what to do. But in certain areas, the narrative is institutionalized. Oh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to sort of check white and then that's what you're supposed to do because you're not black. I mean, depends how you see it. If you see the question as what I'm uh, what I'm not, you know, I'm not black, I'm not Asian, you know, maybe I'm supposed to be this, right? Or if you see it as, you know, I'm Latino and it's not here and you check off that. Of course, there is lots of intermarriage and there is a question of what the third generation is doing. 
especially with high rates of inter intermarriage between Latinos and whites. But I think with sort of getting at the question of the percentage, which is still straddles the 50%, sort of 50% choose sort of roughly white and 50% don't sort of put in Latino or Mexican or brown or whatever they're going to do on, on the other writing category. But within that 50% that identifies as white, there's still a whole lot of variation. I would argue we don't really know what that means. In fact, um, some people have argued that some of the places that are most likely to check white are in the deep valleys of South Texas, which have some of the highest rates of poverty and first generation immigrants, right? But there, and qualitative research has shown there, the people that are checking white see it as a proxy for nationality. Like, oh, I'm American, this is what Americans are, must, you know, I'm white because I'm not Mexican, right? Because there's so much of, uh, you know, citizenship differences, and citizenship is an important line there. So, you know, with these questions, I feel like uh, there's still so much variation to learn about what these categories actually mean. Darren? Uh, I was wondering if you know of any studies that uh, take a cross-cultural view what you've been proposing today in, in countries like uh, India, and, uh, maybe uh, Africa with huge amounts of populations overlapping, or in, uh, in Indonesia, for example, with get more of it that way, or Canada, and even Spain, where uh, in Spain, uh, the Catalans, they, they talk about Spain, but uh, Spain doesn't mean Catalan, but Catalonia. Same as the bad, and the Gallegos uh, over in the Northwest, they've been trying to promote this for some time. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of some of the uh, conditions that you talk about that are, that, that are monetary. Right? Uh, and, and we're going to have an interesting vote soon uh, yeah. about this in Spain. Well, this is like the, the best place to come. It's like my new research is on Spain now. So I think, uh, I think uh, the census is ground zero for these debates. I think that they start sort of arguing and fomenting this identity, and then they bring it to the state. And so far as I know, um, the Census Bureau in Spain can tell you, you know, where you're born. Or, and then, you know, Catalonia invests a whole lot in creating their own census because they have... Uh, an interest in, in sort of, you know, telling how many numbers or even augmenting their numbers or, or what have you. Uh, and, you know, and Madrid, Spain refuses to provide, you know, those numbers in large part. I mean, they'll tell you what state you're at, but they won't tell you if you're maybe the Madrid person that moved to Catalonia or you're the Catalan person that's in. So it resists creating this ethnicity uh, sort of categorization. In large part, they know because when you have the numbers, then this is power, right? This is powerful. You can make these claims in all these kinds of ways. What's incredibly interesting is if you think Catalonia is also the site of large-scale migration recently, right? In Spain more generally, especially from Latin America. And since I've been there, what I've been looking at is um, how even like Catalan politicians and political parties and state agencies vie to try to foment a Latino Catalan identity versus like a Latino Spanish identity, doing things like actually, and I have it in my office, creating sort of faux history texts that sort of show the Catalan uh, impact on Latin America and sort of, it, you know, that's taking the, it that's up. That's the part of Catalonia that I know, though. Yeah. Frankly, <laughs> that's, that's a different part. The part I know is incredibly nationalistic. Yeah, yeah, to sort of foment this, to sort of well, foment and create. I, I don't know if they're promoting, fomenting yeah. that so much. Uh, but they're focusing on their own yeah. identity. Which is true. There are also strands that are sort of interested in creating sort of the numbers in this by sort of regenerating the identity in terms of like the immigration flows that are coming in. Okay, this yeah, I have a question um, about sort of bureaucratic precedents for the census categories that you're describing and periods previous to this and especially thinking about um, organizations like the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. Yeah. And I know that organization was really important for the creation of a sort of Asian American category. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, so I'm not sure if Hispanic was a category in that particular yeah. form of census, but I'm wondering if there were any sort of precedents 
kind of going back earlier in time yeah. to the kind of categorization and whether or not that created some sort of bureaucratic momentum. You had inconsistent precedent. So uh, the EE, um, the Equal Employment, uh, you know, the EEOC definitely had employment statistics. Sometimes they had a category called Spanish American, but it's not clear whether this was synonymous with just uh, Mexican or sort of the Mexican Americans, because this category would be used in uh, the Southwest, but when they would run that same, those same statistics, it was Puerto Rican. And so sometimes they would comment on Mexican and Puerto Rican statistics differently. Sometimes they would comment on Spanish Americans. One would argue that when they're talking about Spanish Americans, they weren't really envisioning all these groups together. Sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes they wouldn't. So it was really inconsistent and spotty. Um, where I don't think that this is a basis, so I think that there's some idea, just like there's some idea of Latin America exists that it's as, a, as a region that's different, but I don't think it's institutionalized because there's a couple of things. You don't get it to travel to the Census Bureau at all. And since this bureau is a place where you develop all the statistics that the EEOC really relies on, the EEOC has its own employment statistics in certain areas, but like I said, it's inconsistent that. The second thing is that when the Johnson administration starts to finally think about poverty in Latino neighborhoods, they develop what's called, the first thing they do is they develop what's called the Interagency on Mexican American Affairs. They don't develop the Interagency on Spanish Speaking Affairs or things like this. This transitions during Nixon. Um, this becomes different during Nixon as sort of uh, he comes into office and as sort of other developments within Congress occur and people start focusing on the census and these negotiations of which categories are actually viable that we can use start to come about. So I would, I would sort of frame it as spotty and inconsistent, um, but you still had the executive branch, you still had the Census Bureau, these other parts of government, um, viewing them largely as independent groups. I have four people, so I'm going to try to make it as quickly so all the answers can get in there. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was a very good story and uh, very well told and theorized. Um, thank you. And I kept thinking there was one issue that kept going through my mind, and it was within the uh, what emerges as the Hispanic group in, 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 in all its in the three dimensions you describe it, particularly in the uh, uh, national in the National Council of Barbasa. And and it's it's about what goes on within it. And the the problem comes to mind for me at first. Um, when you have La Raza, you have uh, what what seem to be uh, relatively militant or, or uh, uh, you know, and categorically on the left uh, uh, movements suddenly get, and suddenly we're talking about them dealing with Cubans, you know. So, so you know, who are the Republican Latinos par excellence? Um, so I, I wound up thinking, what is, what's going on inside you know, how do they reconcile the political differences? Is it, that's, so I kept having this, this notion that there's a, there's a piece of the story relatively peripheral that I was interested in. Yeah, well, yeah um, okay. What's well, done is it's, per, it's not peripheral, it's certainly part of it. Um, you do see a lessening over time of sort of a nationalist language. Like one of the things I traced is. Um, uh, these monthly newsletters that NCLA produces, and you can sort of see Chicano, Aslan, Raza as a term, things like exploitation plummet. And then more things like American nationalism, American sort of sense that we're an American group comes together, right? And you've got more articles later on on what do we mean? We mean culture. You're not necessarily tying Hispanics to exploitation as much as sort of Chicano was tied to that. Um, one of the things that happens is when they bring, and early on, it, these same people that started NCLR were part of the group of people that would argue uh, in, in these uh, Latino summit or, or Hispanic Federation movements that, you know, they actually said Cubans are a different breed. They come of a different race, and they would say they're the doctors and dentists and lawyers. This is how they were a different breed, right? One of the things that they do, and 
in Chicano writing early on, there's a lot of connections to the Cuban Revolution in a very positive way, especially the image of Che Guevara and especially this image of Latin America rising up. That's totally disappears. What largely disappears is they decide to not touch the hot button issues. One of the ways that Cubans can come in is they do two things. One, they don't form ties with the ultra-nationalists, the people that are just really focused on bringing down Castro. They wait until what emerges is a group of, of a cadre of Cuban leaders that are focused much more on social welfare issues. You've got the Mariel sort of boat groups that come about and suddenly you've got these poor Cubans and they would like money for bilingual vocational training programs. They'd like money for bilingual education and whatnot. They get those. And the second thing they do is they stop talking about Cuba. They decide that whatever is Hispanic is an American thing. So we're going to talk about a few select issues. We're going to talk about bilingual education. They don't even talk about immigration this early on. They talk about poverty, and they certainly talk about representation in government jobs, in different industries, in sort of getting Hispanics sort of at represented in all kinds of parts of the labor market. So they definitely make some trade-offs. Uh, and that's sort of part of being able to bring in the Cuban. They don't talk about Puerto Rican independence either, for example. And they don't make the connection with sort of the independistas. They make it with sort of the more moderate lines that are focused on sort of urban poverty and mobility issues. Okay, we have three people, seven minutes. We may not get to everybody, so if you could be brief on the questions you've made, Jane. I guess I just wanted to say thank you for a fantastic and really interesting talk. You did in the US. There was a, what kept popping up for me is the, the complete strangeness of what you were talking about. Because honestly, it, it is so strange to have been able to invent a common cause between people who came from a Mexican-directed background and were laborers, many of them in Texan uh, fields, right? Yeah. To make common cause with people who were from the Caribbean, where yeah. the origins of the Caribbean were so utterly and totally different in every respect. And so what you just answered back to Larry actually began to sort of unpack some of that. But the move of only Vision to go to the East Coast was brilliant because what they did was take to the East Coast and educate the East Coast of, of, and reframe for them what what was going on. But I, it, it, it struck me as being the invasion of the outsiders from the Southwest mm -hmm. to go to the East Coast and claim and bring in and create seats at the table for Puerto Ricans and Cubans who were never going to make common cause because of the social class. Yeah, it was strategic. They lost a whole lot of money. I, my big question when I was first doing some of the research is, why did they move to New York? It's, it, the, you know, it's, real estate is so expensive. They could have easily just kept doing this Phoenix, San Francisco, Fresno, whatever. Why, for, why move there? And it was not until I started talking to them and they're saying it's about legitimacy. And he was like, yeah. We lost so much money early on. We were bleeding. You know, all our money needed to go just to keep up our New York station. And the New York station was there for legitimacy because they needed Madison Avenue. They needed to be seen as a presence. And then all of these different groups were basically maintained. I mean, they all said they're basically, the network was being run from the hugely popular revenue that was coming in from San Antonio and Los Angeles that was maintaining these things. Over time, what they're able to do is create these local level programs that can appease these people in some ways. And then when they start doing their own programming, that's the genius of it, right? That's when they start, you know, this is how we're not all of this Mexico, this is how we can bring these groups together. But they have to make these trade offs and finance these huge losses early on. We are going to make it. We have our last question. Uh, from the period you're looking at in 1960 Yeah. Um, do you have a sense of when we started using the term Latino? Uh. Uh, right? you know, because I think full show that just as much as not really more from the Hispanic population also identified as a Latino. Yeah. Like that, so, uh, that part too is that next paper. 
So the, I, I had a hard time. I think I originally had this book called like Making Latinos or Latinos was in because I, I don't know. I think in my own self, I never called myself Hispanic. I'm from LA. I called myself Latina. Um, but then someone pointed out that the term that was there that was being used was Hispanic and it was important to keep the Hispanic term in its historical context. Um, uh, Latino, so it's on different levels. If I look at activist language, it's Hispanic, Hispanic, and then Latino starts come, and it's predominantly Hispanic, and there's an early sort of use of Latino, which then dips because it's almost like everyone decides this is our term. So Spanish-speaking, Spanish-American, Spanish-origin, all those terms go down. I mean, there's, there's conscious effort to everyone have the same term. Um, but Latino sort of resurges in a lot of academic debates and sort of the academy starts to come in and people start thinking philosophically like what does it mean when we're using a term that connects us to Spain versus using another term even though it's not perfect that perhaps might have a different geographical connotation. And sort of that sort of maintains itself. It's also Latino maintains itself in the arts world. Like it's Latino salsa, it's like Latino is, is the term that's used in sort of musical movements that sort of come in in the 1980s and you know, predominate in the 1990s, which sort of helps the resurgence of this term. And then activists, just start, you see it in the, in the late 80s, they just decide we're gonna slash, we're not gonna you know, choose both terms, we're gonna make these terms synonymous. So you see Hispanic slash Latino, which then the census does, and sort of everybody starts doing it um, almost synonymously. Well, it looks like we've uh, hit the